some definitions here, just kind of quickly. Um, this is just definition from my own discernment and thinking, and you may have a different way of looking at it, and, and that I think would be okay too, because we have to we have to look at it from our own perspective, and then if we have the time, we can bring those together and find a common one. But this is a starting one. Okay, truth is a humble, comprehensive, inclusive process. Okay, have to get your ego out of the way. It includes a lot of stuff, and it has to include other perspectives. And it's a process. There is no final truth that we can lay our hat on. Okay. It's a discovery of what's relevant and meaningful. And that, of course, is relative to where you are and who you are and who you're with and, and what's going on. Okay. True is what's accurate and consistent from various perspectives based on what we know up till now. And that up till now is a critical piece. It's a phrase that Ab Abraham Maslow used, and I borrowed it thousands of times <laughs> with, with, in my counseling. And yes, th that's happening up till now. And this guy got really angry at me. He said, you keep on saying up till now. <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's up till now. And d based on the decisions you make, you know, it'll either continue or go in a different direction. And so having that tentative nature to it allows us to keep learning and keep exploring. Okay. So the obstacles to truth, we talked about uh, stress and tension and how that does it, and fear really uh, gives us that in spades. Okay. Fear stops us from asking, inf asking questions and, and looking at new information. Our brain automatically goes to what worked before. We don't take in new information. Our focus is narrow. We're just going to be reactive uh, rather than responsive. Okay. We talked about stress and tension. Um, I think certainty is the enemy of truth. As soon as we're certain, we stop learning. And we can never have the whole picture. Okay. And you can say, well, there are some subjects where I can be real certain, okay, like anatomy. Let's say, um, you know, we pretty much have studied anatomy for a century and, and know a lot about it. Um, well, let me tell you a story about anatomy. This actually happened uh, earlier in the, in the 20th century. But still, it was at a time when they thought they knew quite a bit about it. Uh, they had a problem with SIDS, sudden, sudden infant death syndrome, as we have continually. And someone uh, realized that uh, the children who were dying from SIDS appeared to have enlarged thyroids. Um, and so they started to uh, radiate every child they found who had an enlarged thyroid. They would screen them to see. And it turned out that 10,000 children died as a result of the radiation in trying to deal with the enlarged thyroid. And then in 1930, there was a researcher who looked into this a little further, who started asking questions, and he realized that the, the, the anatomy textbooks that had described the size of the thyroid were based on autopsies of poor children in England, living in high stress situations, undernourished, okay, who died young. And they all had small thyroids. The kids that were being radiated had normal size thyroids. It didn't interfere with their breathing or cause SIDS at all. 10,000 died. And the saddest thing about this is many thousand of those died after this man published his results. And it wasn't until the 1950s that they actually stopped that radiation process, 20 years later. Okay, because people had that certainty. This is what it says. Okay, I need to fix it. And the child dies. So certainty in many respects can be seen as the enemy of truth. Okay? And then, of course, there's the, the manipulation, which we're getting more and more familiar with because people are getting more and more adept at it. Um, and also isolation, and they're getting good at that too. To the extent that we're isolated and only talk to people that agree with us, we're going to think we're more and more right, and that leads us back into the certainty and the rigidity. Um, and, of course, ego. Um, I cannot want to hear something that, that is going to make me not look good. So I'm going to filter that out.
Uh, the, the part that I was really uh, interested in in that is the pruning process. Um, and there are some people who believe that this is a natural thing that happens developmentally uh, when children reach the age of five or six, but something else happens when the children reach the age of five or six. They go to school, okay, and they sit all day instead of exploring, and, and they stop asking questions or they start asking fewer questions. Okay. The average three-year-old, I don't find these numbers right, asks like 40 questions a day uh, of, of her parents. The average 14-year-old, maybe a couple. <laughs> okay. um, children ask thousands and thousands of questions. As we get older, we ask fewer and fewer. Um, and so what is that doing to our brain? And you have to think about what our brain really does it's, it's our filter for reality. It's our vehicle for interpreting reality. Okay, this, my brain is, 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 traveling the pathways of my brain gives me a picture of what I believe is true and what's happening. Okay, and uh, there's an analogy that I found that, that's really helpful in terms of understanding the brain, and that's thinking of brain uh, connections as roads. And they're called pathways, so it's, it's not a leap, but they're actually, it's pretty accurate because any thought or memory or image that we have is a, is a connection between a series of neurons. Um, and, and when you see that connection again, you go to the same place, okay? So I was going for a walk this morning. I was supposed to meet Hob uh, at 10.30 and it was 20 after, so I decided to go for a walk. And I saw Hob walking and I knew immediately it was Hob even though he wasn't where I expected to see him because he's my neighbor and I know him well. And so I, would, I recognized him immediately, okay? I haven't, I think you were, I've seen you once before, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah you were at the last yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I had a, a, a somewhat of a recollection, but I wasn't 100% sure, okay? Uh, because we'd only met once before for that brief time, okay? Um, if we took a class together, I would remember you for a much longer period of time, okay? So, but every time, if you could look at my brain when I, when I saw your face, okay, it goes to the exact same place where that's stored, okay? So at any given moment, we're either creating new pathways or we're reinforcing old pathways. And if we don't use a pathway, it gets pruned, okay? Things are forgotten. People that I met in my 20s and 30s, if I ran into that I didn't have a lot of contact with, you know, would take a lot of catching up, and I might need to even remember that I ever knew them, depending on how well I knew them back then. So those are pruned. Um, but the important thing to remember is that pruning process is something that can be under our control. Okay, we can choose what to prune by where we go with our brain and what we do with our brain. So that gets us back to asking questions. When we're just simply learning something in isolation, and if you think about how schools are structured, okay, you've got arithmetic and you close those books and put them away, and now you're doing reading and you close those books and put them away, and now you're doing geography, you close that, put it away, and now you're doing science, you close that. It's done in separate, isolated topics, and there's not a lot of connections between them. And that's actually a problem in science today because so many scientists, they're just beginning now to, to, to talk across sciences and find that a lot of solutions, particularly for health problems, involve more than one specific area of science. So they're, they're starting to work together and see a much larger picture more clearly, okay? So if you think of those lines as roads or pathways in our brain, if all we do is go to school and learn things in, in passively, receptively, we're not creating links between or across those. We're not asking questions, okay? So, so we don't jump from one link to the other. We don't make those communications, and it's hard to, to connect that. But if we're forming pathways with questions and reflection, first of all, it's easier to remember because it comes from our sense of self. A question that I ask, and it's gonna be more important than a question, that, an answer that may be given to me. Okay, if it comes from my interest and my curiosity, it already has a, a, a smoother path to travel than if it's just given to me passively. 
Same thing if it's something that's done out of my experience because it's connected with all the sensory organs and, and, and there's a lot of other things happening, visual and, and, and kinesthetic and, and, and a senses that, that we have that, that connect to that pathway so it has more ways to get there. Um, whereas if I'm taking a, uh, a geography test, okay, I've got to be on this pathway, okay? Um, but if I want to know something, I can get there uh, a lot of different ways if I'm forming pathways through question and reflection. And I think that's one of the more critical things about uh, being able to discern what's coming into us from the media and what we do with it. And just the very process of asking those questions is developing your brain further. And the good news is, is that pruning is not permanent. We can create new pathways, and there's a lot of evidence for that. So, so we're not fixed. Uh, as soon as the more we qu ask questions, the more we look at things from different perspectives, the more connections and pathways we make. Okay. Okay, so this is a map of Ann Arbor, and there's lots of pathways. Um, you have almost an infinite number of ways to get from one place to another. There's also highways. There's, there's uh, uh, 14 is there, 94 is going through there. You can get there more quickly, but you don't have many options. Okay, so it's limited. And so pathways that are well-traveled are faster, uh, but we can't get on them off them as much. We, they aren't connected with the other ones, okay? So what happens when we continually just go to the same pathways, and if you're thinking now in terms of political thinking and, and messages that we get from our politicians, okay, this is in many respects their idealized way of forming our pathways. Because when you're on your train, that's all you see. That's your right definition of reality, and you're going to be a consistent voter. Um, you can get off at the station, and, uh, but there aren't a lot of stations, <laughs> okay? Uh, and not a lot of incentive for, for getting off because they also tie into our essential need for belonging, and, and so you have to bypass that in order to get off at the station. Okay, so if you think of paths and roads as the analogy for, uh, for how our brain works, we got a lot of options how we move around. Okay, I can just sit still and reflect and think, and my mind can go anywhere when I do that. Okay, I can think about a thousand years ago or a thousand years in the future. I can project that. I can think about what happened yesterday, what I'm going to do tonight. Uh, I'm pretty much free, and it's a lot slower. Okay, in terms of because I'm creating new pathways as I'm as I'm doing that reflection, um, and and but it's totally flexible. I can go wherever I choose and I'm creating new pathways all the time. As you pick up speed from walking to driving on side roads, okay, it speeds up. Okay, you'll get there faster, okay, you'll, you'll remember that because you've been over it. It's been repeated again and again, and emotion paves the road, so there's a connection with emotion. Fear is that's why it's such a powerful political tool, because fear just, fear just automatically paves the road and we go there first, and that creates the railroad tracks the quickest. Um, so as we move from asking questions and understanding and exploring, our mind works faster and we don't take the time to look at the larger picture or other perspectives. Once we start being more passive and just taking information in from lecture or memorizing or text without, it, without integrating or questioning it, um, then we're giving up more and more control and the input uh, uh, is something that we have less influence over. Okay. And we're just reinforcing old pathways until we get to the trains and then once you get on an airline, uh, you have no control where that plane takes you. Okay, uh, you're gonna fly that route and you're gonna get to that other airport and chances are it's gonna look just like the airport you left. Um, and uh, <laughs> that's the way it is. Same thing is happening to your brain and that's why media literacy and paying attention to what is true is so important. That's why asking questions are so important uh, because they develop our brain to its capacity. And people used to say that our brain was used at 10% of their capacity and that's when they thought of it as a machine and we're just only using this part. But we're probably using less of that capacity now than we were 50 years ago because we've got way more railroad tracks in our brain than we have before. 
Okay, we have much less interaction with each other and, and much more interaction from screens and things like that that are just coming at us one way and we're passive recipients rather than uh, active learners of, of, of what we're doing. Okay? So the brain pathways basically determine our reality. That's the vehicle for our interpretation and understanding of what is real. So that's critical. That determines what your life is about. And it's up to us how we form them and what we do with them.